Thanks everyone for coming. I'm Timo from Basin. Basin, I think the way to think of it is real estate for refi and connecting the real world to the metaverse and helping create the regenerative actions and outcomes we want to see in the world using land and real estate and all the technology and different things at our disposal. This recording, which you know, will be posted on YouTube and whatnot, is our effort to build in public, to learn in public. So thank you for agreeing to be recorded here. There is a Miro board link that I'll post in the recording notes. I think all of you have it uh, by now. If you don't, just, just uh, someone can share it in the, in the DMs here in a minute. We are working from the Notion page, which is public. Send me your emails if you want to join the Notion page and edit it, whatnot. It, is, it obviously is a public page to be edited. But yeah, thanks for being here. I think without rehashing all the work we've done over the last six months or eight months or whatnot, that's in the Notion document. I wanted to start off with a little, two little kind of workshops in the, the Miro board. If everyone can go to the Miro link, and I guess to preface it, I, I have 20 years experience in the commercial and investment real estate and every, everything I do, at least everything I'm doing in refi and climate space, I, I can't help myself, but see it through the lens of real estate and real property and real assets and private property law and whatnot. Hi, Will. How are you? <laughs> Good. And so I know there's a lot of discussion in the, the refi space about land trust and private property ownership and the commons and whatnot, but I think we're going to leave that for a different discussion. And the, and the reason being is that uh, I think we use the tools we have, right? If you're in your workshop or you're going down the street, like you, if you're trying to fix something now urgently and you need to get somewhere, you use the tools at your disposal. And so to me, real property, real estate law the institutions that we have in place, whether it be Roman law or English law or other types of jurisdictional law, whatnot. I think we need to personally, I think we need to use those tools and we can change the system along the way. And we can work towards more commons and different types of ownership structures and, and things like that while we go. But, but for me, it's let's use what we have now to create the results we want as fast as possible. And so this idea of, if you look at a piece of land or an ecosystem. If you start at the earth or a bio biome or a bio region, and you look at nature and you look at ecosystems and ecosystem services, it, it's that, right? Without putting a name, if you take permaculture or whatnot, and you don't name it, you just observe it. But you look at, okay, it, it is what it is until we label it. We label it all those things. And then we take another layer of like human construct of nations and states and cities and towns and all the laws and the jurisdiction that goes along with it. To me, that gives us a tool and if you look at property like a polygon, right? If you have boundary lines and just, let's just imagine we're working in a, in a future world with just polygons and you have one big polygon and that's your property. And then you might have sub polygons where you do different things in that. Charlie, you and I have talked about it. All of us have talked different times about this, but each sub polygon can be overlapping. They can be independent of each other, but one polygon could be for Ponderosa reforestation. Another polygon could be for wetlands restoration, mitigation, enhancement. Another polygon could be for recreation only. This could overlay the whole main polygon, but it can be a sub polygon as well. So the idea being is like in, like in basin, we like to use these kind of metaphors of instead of like piece the doors or it's colonialization, right? Is a bad word of manifest destiny. It's I look at this as like manifest destiny for carbon, climate, nature, biodiversity, species, not just humans. It's not, not, it's all the things that came in the past, right? That's our, our extractive society is built on of oil and gas and tulips and all these things. Money has been, been built on in the past. This is like a new form of money of like regenerative money. And to me, natural capital is all derived from the land, from the earth, because it is right. And so we need to figure out how to connect those things, connect the, the earth, the ecosystem services to the real world using the tools we have. So. With that said, if we go into the basin the, or the, the basin stack work session, the first one, the top box there says, what do you want to see in the real world on the ground? So I, I thought we'd just start with why, like what, what do you want to see and feel free to raise your hand, use the raise hand functionality to ask a question or make a comment. But what, what do you want to see in the world? If you're walking down the street or if you're flying in an airplane and you're looking down at at the planet, or if you're in a blimp, or if you're at the ocean, the beach, if you're in Guatemala, if you're in Carbondale, if you're in Amarillo, Portland, wherever, what do you want to see in your neighborhood, your town, where you go hiking, where you go camping, where you go on vacation, where you go to school, where you, where you work, like just anything you want to 
just drop a sticky note on the left. You can use the, a lot of times I use the bulk mode and we can resize them later, but the bulk mode allows you to just type a list. But we'll just give five minutes. I'm going to set a timer for five minutes and just feel free to ask questions, talk, whatnot, but I'm going to turn my mic off just while we do this. So we're the notion stack. There's like the stack brainstorm. Is that where we're doing this? Oh yeah. So in, yeah, in the notion, the stack down on the right, there's another link. It says past meetings recording. And there's a notion that we're doing today. There's a, a new notion page. Let me just copy the link here. Yeah. Thanks. And then the Miro, Miro one it's in there as well, but I'll drop the Miro as well too. And feel free to add anything to that notion page for today, like at, put your Twitter handle or your LinkedIn or your project name, and I'm going to turn the mic off. And, and just as a side note to that, that bulk function, if you click on the sticky note link at the left, it goes down you go down to the bottom of all the colored sticky notes and you do bulk mode, then you can just type in line items and then hit return and it will drop in five or 10 or 20 bulk sticky notes. If you want to use that function. Okay. So why don't we, uh, we got about a half minute left. Everyone just wants to finish up on their ends there. And I'd like to just open the, the floor to just talk about what we put there and why. And, and feel free to use the raise hand function. We want to give space for everyone to, to talk and say their part. So a commonality I see are like people, there's, there's active engagement by people in the landscape. And so it's not like a, it's not like a park or wilderness area where people are tourists to like stick to the trails and view, but it, it's a landscape where people are participants. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Josh. Yeah. I'm seeing, I guess I think about it a lot. I'm also seeing people being able to be paid to have their livelihoods yeah. from this. I, I focused, I split in two with like urban and suburban and just basically what I was talking about, rural communities, there's just so much like culture, there's so much of a cultural shift that needs to be done to get a lot of rural work communities to really be encouraged by this kind of work. And I think like bringing that, so in Oregon, so I almost got right now in Oregon, we have a big shift and rift between the urban and rural areas specifically because there's a lot of like logging that we have basically in the cities we're trying to decrease logging that's in the rural areas and rural communities which built on logging infrastructure. And I think there's like a big misunderstanding of what urban environmentalists want and what where our logging communities want as well. Like I think there's just, I guess what I'm saying is there's a lot of space to bring us back together. And this is kind of the way I see it. Happen. Sorry, that was really scattered. No, no, it's awesome. I, lo I love all that. Active engagement, be paid for livelihood, that contact between ur urban and rural. That's a whole, a whole nother like layer. Cultural shifts and then incentives. I think Josh, what I heard you say is like shifting the incentives around. Go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of meeting people's livelihoods, but also just, just meeting people's needs. So creating infrastructure that can also help humans and other bio, other forms of biodiversity, whether that's from creating clean water or air quality or providing community resources around food, both growing, storing, and yeah. Just generally meeting people's needs so they don't need to be, so they can detach from, or, or they, they can get more involved in some of these other actions around land restoration. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. So obviously it, animals, plants, how do you feel about the, like the more uh, qualitative things that like, like I, I like to go into the esoteric about like happiness and pe peace and harmony. Some of these other, they're hard to yeah, pinpoint. Go ahead, Hunter. On, on one hand, I love it. On the other hand, I think those are notoriously hard to measure. And, and, and I think when you want to get concrete with these things about adding value, I, I think you run into a lot of challenges there, especially if you're trying to cater to an audience that is typically more business focused. And if you're trying to show value in these, in these assets, I think that message gets clouded by the more, more esoteric balance of it. So qualitative versus quantitative. Yeah. And I think that qualitative, yeah, looks like we lost two. Yeah. But I, I think the qualitative can come through in the storytelling, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's the core of the methodology and approach. Yeah. I'm not sure how much of that you got. I rejected my, I ejected myself out of the meeting. So if you just, yeah, just yeah. say that or again. Yeah, for sure. So, so I basically think the qualitative aspects can come through in some of the storytelling and the messaging around this, but I, I don't know that it's the core of the approach. And maybe it's how you communicate to it to a wider audience. Okay, great. Thank you, Hunter. And then Josh and Charlie. We'll do Josh first and then Charlie. 
And Adam, I'm going to drop the link in the, we're working off this Miro board for Adam who just joined. Yeah. All I want to say on that, so my mom been a researcher of poker health sexology and the biggest thing that she's taken from her work and talks to me about is worker autonomy leads to improvement in pretty much every other area of psychology for workers. And that's why I've been so drawn to this and scream at her basically every night to try to learn this and understand it more, but we'll get there. Basically, this can bring us much more autonomy to just with conditions. It's like food sovereignty. Yeah. I love that, Josh. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, I love that too. I think it's really interesting to think about autonomy and sovereignty at different scales too. There's like the worker, personal level, autonomy, sovereignty. And then a little bit bigger would be probably the watershed or the community, autonomy, sovereignty. That's where you get into places like food sovereignty and kind of the, the ability of the community to choose how the land is used in that community. And then this is where we get more into the DSOC, cutting edge, crazy stuff. But I like, then once one step up from there would be like this new state or like a new type of humans organizing themselves at whatever is bigger than like the community scale. I think that without going down the wormhole too much, obviously the current nation state system has shown itself as completely ineffective, especially around organizing to change climate change. So yeah, just thinking about what would the autonomy of Basin Dow or any of these sort of new groups that are acting as, as aggregators of smaller communities and then fighting for tools and resources for those smaller communities or creating structures like this methodology. And then to just speak to what you were saying, Hunter, I think that you're totally right that it's really important to have the, both the quantitative and the qualitative, depending on the audience. So that, that's where I'd really just say we need to really tailor the messaging and the story to each individual audience group. Cool. All, all great stuff. I, I made handwritten notes of, of that. I'll drop that probably into the notion somewhere at some point. Any other comments on the, what we'll call this part one? Yeah, re really awesome. It's uh, for anyone watching the recording, this is... We'll just we'll label it section one up here, but all right, cool. So section two is down there below. Let me just, I'm just going to resize it real quick. This, this goes back to what I was saying about like Basin using the metaphors and like my analogy of manifest destiny might not be the, the right one or like neo-colonialism because it has such a bad rap. But, the, but the way we look at it is imagine yourselves as like land surveyors or like explorers even. And you're, you're out on the landscape and you, you, you walk through a basin or through a watershed, or it could even be in your town or your street or a creek, a drainage. And you start to think to yourself, okay, how is all this connected? Like, where does this stream go? Where does it come from? How do, where does it flow? Where does the water go after it runs past me? Where, how does it get back to me? And you start to think of things in cycles, but imagine you're like a new type of like explorer and you're like, okay, how could we like not extract this because that's, that's the old model, but how can we regenerate that or engage with that or aid it or create autonomy around it? Or can we, how can we meet the needs, but also the wants? I'm, I'm going off the list of some of the things you, you all have said. So for this next part, imagine yourself on the landscape, just like exploring all those physical components, even maybe going, being a diver and diving below the ocean or being in a blimp or a plane and looking down from above. What are the connection points? Like I, I always joke about like, how do we connect the metaverse to the real world? So how do we do that? What are those connection points? And so this is, it's in that square too. I'm just going to edit that. But just before we get going, does anyone have, we'll do five minutes on this. And does anyone have any questions or comments about that? Okay, cool. So I'll just set aside or go ahead. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. Sorry. So can you just restate that question or is it the, the, the places where the connection points between this utopia reality that we're describing and what exactly web three stuff or so i go back for me and i guess charlie this is my bias right of like real estate of like yeah. property law and property rights so if you are on the property or on the, the land the landscape and if you're in a national park like that's government jurisdiction like that's a connection point of like law and policy if you're at back at your family home in california or something and you're on someone's private property, like you have your own private property was relative to zoning and use and town and city. But then you start to look, with, with, look at both those types of properties, either public property or private property. And you say, what are the rights that are embedded in each of those? Or even Charlie, like from a land trust perspective, you're a land trust, you buy the property. What does the jurisdiction give you the right to do and what can't you do? Like, mm -hmm. 
You can't go build a skyscraper on certain pieces of property. You can't extract the oil and gas from certain pieces of property. You, you can on other pieces of property. So what are all the different connection points of like, in Basin, we use this like analogy of what, what like is on the land, like what might be in the polygon, what flows across the land, which could be air and water, people, animals, species, and what's under the property. So it's above, below, and across. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you start to look at those connection points of what to all those things. So if we look at box one, like no car. So that'd probably be like roads and then water quantity, water quality. That's going to be like rain and streams and the water that flows in and out of the property. So it's just what are more tangible? I think it actually leads back to Hunter's point about what's more quantifiable in the, in the realm of, of the, and I know refi property gets a bad name or bad rap, but it, like we could use land, but for the purposes of what we're doing, we're using property law and property rights to do this. So what are those connection points of what, mm-hmm. what can we drive incentives around? Like, how can we create more biodiversity? How can we increase the water quality? The water Will's working a lot on like water and aquifer recharge. That's like his main thesis. Like, how do we make it so there's mountain bike trails and hiking trails and like people can actually do recreation. Part of ecosystem services, nature's benefits to people are these other value, like cultural, in addition to nature, right? There's cultural and recreational value that's, that nature provides. So it's like, what are these connection points? And that, that's where we're basically starting like at the 30,000 foot level and zooming into the property level. And then these are the cool. connection points. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. What, what long answer, but no, it was helpful. Something that just came to mind is, and Je- Jeff talks a lot about it, is use of prep or the use and the fruit of the land. It's an old, it's a mixed law, like jurisdiction, basically of the ownership of the land is, it's, and Charlie, I think like your work, right, could focus a lot on this, of like that report you're doing, of like the, the, the ownership of the land versus the use, like the uses uh, and the fruit of the land. So like this second one we're looking at to me is more like, what are all the different uses of a piece of property, right? Like it's of, of a piece of land, not just for human use, but what are the, what's, what are like the yeah. uses? Is that, if, I don't know if that. No, totally. I think another interesting one there is splitting up like the ownership versus the use. So if someone is doing regenerative agriculture, that is sequestering electric carbon, that doesn't necessarily have to go to the benefits of that or the financial windfall from that. It doesn't have to go with the actual property owner. So just splitting up also the ability to profit or financialize or sell not only the use, but also the sort of ecological or natural capital that is being gained through certain stewardship practices. I don't know if that, I don't know if I did a very good job explaining that, but which, which one triggered that for you? Just, just what you were just saying, actually, I haven't really written to it yet, but I think in the community land trust model, there's some cool examples of basically like, for example, a farmer who's building a bunch of soil. They still don't own the land itself, but they can own the soil that they're building on that land. And then they could turn around and sell the impact of that, or it doesn't really make sense. They would like scoop that soil up and take it with them. But in terms of the actual law, there, there is precedence for that sort of thing where the actual land layer, like it's almost like slightly below the subsurface could be owned by land trust or some sort of communal ownership. But then the improvements on the land can be owned by the stewards themselves. Obviously, buildings is like a, is a classic example of that. But you can also get into some more interesting like natural capital. They can own the natural capital that they're. Yeah. And it gets weird and it happens different in different states. And so yeah. like there's going to be owners of minerals, many thousands of feet below the surface. And they might like th- there might be somebody that's entitled to produce at 2000 feet and then somebody else that's entitled to produce at 3500 feet. And then the else is running a, a waste disposal or an injection and they're injecting at 1500 feet. And you would think all of that involves the mineral owner, but if they're storing carbon in one of these strata, for example, that isn't the mineral owner, that's the landowner, even if it's 1500 feet under the ground, which is absurd. Yeah. And so these have currently been broken out into very specialized, highly defined, and sometimes hard to figure out structures. It's water. About that. And it's all state by state. As well, that's that's what I discovered too. Cool. Let's go around and just use your hand raising feature again. And Charlie and Will, feel free to go again. But let's just discuss number two for a minute and see what emerges. The thing that came to my mind as Will was talking was the complexity of the legal system and how difficult would be to implement these things freely with minimal overhead and maximal energetic investment into the actual restoration. And that idea of like bioregional laws 
came up. Like John Wesley Powell, after he rafted down the Grand Cap, Grand Canyon was like, hey, we need to design all this shit around water. And all the governors were like, hey, fuck you. That doesn't make money right now. Adam, I'm just, that's my John Wesley Powell map. I love that. <laughs> on the, wa the water chat map right across from my... Very cool. Yeah, like why, like creating interstate networks to make legal jurisdictions that are life sheds, which is like watershed. But I think that would create I guess the legal guardrails for this to happen. So we're not like always hacking together, you know, what, like what exists. It's just things hacked together. And as well as it's just, just in that one small example, there's so much complexity and room for error. So creating more whole legal structures that, that really provide the guardrails for this work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, I love the white shed concept. It's a, it's a side note, but like the, in the rights of nature movement and what they're doing in New Zealand. And then some of the South, South American countries are doing it with giving in New Zealand, they used orphanage law, right? So they determined that the watershed or the mountain was a orphan and needed a, a guardian. So there's some, so Adam, I think bef before you joined, we've like, one of the prefaces of this is to like the big goal, I think of refi is to change this whole system, like long-term, but it's like, how do we use today? Like, how do we bridge that gap until there are life shed laws or bioregional laws or someone who mentioned like the nation state and the failure of nation states like how do we do that now how do we move to that direction how do we set up a system and that so to me that's like where we're headed with this I, I want everyone else to talk but some of the other groups that like charlie and i are working with or the rwa consortium over in DeFi, they're talking about these like frameworks and these standards even if the laws aren't in place now, but how can you connect like the use to a certain piece of property? Going back to like, these nested polygons, Basin is working with Jeff here in the Aspen Valley Land Trust and Jeff's wife, 150 acres on the river, beautiful piece of property, got tons of different uses. Like how do you do a polygon for the house? The previous landowner has a life estate on the house. So how could you use refi or web three to carry that life estate on and connect it to the real world? A portion of the property is a barn, a portion of the property has a fire pit, a portion of the property has endangered orchid flower, a portion of the property has beavers, there's fishing, incredible fishing along the bank. Like how can we set up these frameworks or standards? And that's, so that's the point of this number two is like starting to create these synapses or these like connections of like all these outcomes we want. And then connecting it at the property level. Cause I think if, if we can do it property by property by property town by town, a city like that. To me, that's how we create change. Go ahead, Charlie. You just sparked something for me that was basically like what the question number two is almost looking at. It's like, we have these ideas, like a, a life shed legal organization. You're like, okay, but how do we translate that into the legal realities of now? What is the best sort of closest match to that? And then how can we continue to develop that? Whether it's a good community land trust or any of these other like legal tools that we have right now. And that's something we keep coming up against in my group is just like, we're just Frankensteining all these different legal structures together to try to build something that is close enough to what we're really going. For. So yeah, anyways, that just like sparked for me that like this, the, that the question number two almost could be reframed as what structures and tools do we have right now? How close are they to this ideal that we're shooting for? And how can we continue to push this? this current structure we have and have it be a little bit less Frankenstein-y in like future iterations. Yeah, it, that, that's awesome, Charlie. I, I've made notes of all that. So Hunter has his hands up. We'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit, Charlie. Yeah, I was, I was gonna jump off there. Like make, moreover, what are the commonalities between existing legal structures? There's clearly it's a Frankenstein in mess here, but you'd have to imagine that there are some commonalities between in say Texas property rights law and oh, I don't know, Massachusetts property rights law, e even if they're different in a number of extremely significant ways. And I'm wondering if that's a, an interesting way to frame this question of, like, okay, what can land provide? Like to put it in the context of what, what is applicable to land across, uh, say the entire un United States, like before we even get into international property rights, because that's a whole different can of worms. But like, what, what is common? What can we build here where we're not gonna have to redo it 50 times? for each state water the federal like the founders never defined the role of the federal government to water and so all of our states have gone in and defined 
what water is and whether or not it's property. And yeah, that seems the opportunity. And then Charlie's comment, it seems to me that we have a whole bunch of tools and we're all assuming there's going to be support and funding for this. Like somebody's going to give a shit if we improve the resilience of a watershed. And so I, I'm starting to think that we start by like the sustainability or the impact bonds. Because like in my head conceptually, that is a way to to facilitate financing of regenerative projects in a bioregional area. And as to how that happens, I don't really care. I hope Basin does it one way and somebody else does another. And, and we, we need to bring in the money so our bankers think that this is real and will fund things. Anyone else before we discuss? I want to unpack some of that stuff. Hannah or Josh or Jeff, anyone have more comments on, on number two? I'm just not as familiar with like kind of modern real estate stuff personally, but I was just reading through like on the Oregon.gov website about, I guess it's like a forest land program and how they, it's how they like, I guess factor out different tracts of land based on productivity for harvest. And I guess keying in on that is not just obviously for harvest, but, and I, I feel like there's just a lot of movement, at least that can be done in certain states. So I guess get more meaning to it, like a lot of these bonds to not just be focused on like our timber harvest, but also generation. Yeah, Josh, to that point, like I think, and I think, Will, you talked about it a lot of like yield, like historically land has all been quantified and in, in how much can it yield us? And that's, that's the problem with like soil depletion, like how much water can we get out of it? How much oil, how many barrels of oil can it yield? So if we can change the, the yield, I think to me, like this, this concept of yield, right. And ecological assets and wealth, I think it actually carries over very, very well from the financial world of Josh, to like what you said about like, how can we yield more biodiversity or how can we yield more ecosystem services? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Cool. How's everyone on time? Do you want to, you want to wrap it an hour or people want to stay over and just free form it? I feel like that's a pretty good start. Cool one. Yeah, I, I'm going to hang out till 2.30 my time, so another th 30 minutes or so. But I think that the next step, in, and Will, it'll be fun to get your comments on it, and it goes to what, what Charlie and Adam and Josh just said as well. What can we use, or, or Hunter, where, where's the overlap, right, of the thing systems? And I don't know if this is true or not, but someone told me that, like, the LLC was, like, originated for oil and gas, to like, and for, for corporations and business to limit and for the wealthy landholders to limit their liability. And this is what all my clients use. They have hundreds of LLCs. So to me, that's like, that's a tool Basin's going to use. But I, to me, that's like a, a perfect tool that we can use. It's perfect because you can use it against like the way it's been used. Like we can take advantage of these property laws for our own purposes, just like oil and gas did in there. And yet, so the LLC is a creature of statute. And so if your state has limited liability companies, your state passed, like your legislature passed a, a, a bill that says we're going to allow for LLCs to be created. And it is highly effective in terms of activating capital. But what we've seen since the rise of the LLC is just, just the oil and gas field works like the money goes to executives and shareholders and people like people make much money in the oil field. All of those public obligations get ignored. And so they're sold to somebody else who sells them to somebody else who sells them to somebody else. And by the time they sell it to the, the final guy, like nobody can expect that guy to clean it up because he doesn't have the wherewithal and they're posting record profits. I, I do say I, I was really pleased to see Carbon Path enter refi. They've got a methodology that like looks at an uncapped, an orphaned, but this well is emitting gas and it's bad for the environment. And they're going to sit and figure out how much gas is emitting, quantify that, go in and cap the well and get a, a carbon credit basically on that proven benefit. And this is something that, that's historically been like, so in Texas, the agency responsible for capping wells is the Railroad Commission. It's normally a public obligation. So that's why carbon pass really interesting. Well, that's, that's an interesting point about like public obligation and passing that on to philanthropy and in government. The analogy I use is like the Sackler family of, hey, we're going to make tons of money and then we're going to take that money and we're going to put it in a philanthropy or a charity and then we're going to get our name on a building and that's our, that's, we cause all this harm in society, 
but we're going to try and mask that harm by giving just a little bit away, making it look like it's a lot. And they should be liable for if they, the companies that polluted the land, right? Or the rivers or the same, like they should, the public obligation, right? So to me, embedded in what we're doing or like the land trust mechanism, like maybe we should step up, right? And take ownership of the public obligation. And maybe we should just own that. I know there's a lot of liability and a lot of risk. I'm just I'm spitballing, but what do you think about that? Everyone, that's a that's an open question. I, I like the idea of going in and like acquiring infrastructure. I do think that if we don't know what we're doing, we're going to get screwed. And and so there's that helium deal that like I sent you. And, and so like the the federal government's got forty thousand acres of minerals and a bunch of facilities associated with the National Helium Reserve. And they're auctioning that off. I have no idea why the whole thing smells. And and it's it seems almost like a redemption DAO kind of use case. But uh, we don't have any idea what we're doing. Yeah, I don't know what to do with that. We need to enlist industry. And that's been really hard. And then, and I, so I just dropped that. And then, Will, that's a great example of like infrastructure and risk. You know, you're, you're talking about like a redemption style DAO or a constitution style DAO to like go and figure that out. But none of us knew like the helium markets and we don't understand. If you look at that GSA list from that website, it's like a highly, highly complicated real estate transaction. So saying I always use this like in real estate, it's, it's easy to buy, but it's, it's easy to get in, but very, very hard to get out. Like you can, it's the greater sucker theory. Oh, I'm going to get a great deal on this like helium property, but oh shit, like what do we, and that's what the LLC, like to our benefit, that's what the LLC is meant to do. Like they're, they're, they are bankruptcy remote. So it's almost if we use the laws that were created to protect, right, other, these other extractive industries, we don't have to re, this is, this is the point of what I think we're thinking about. We don't have to rewrite that law. Like we just do what they're doing. Yeah, you like you, serious LLC. And so like if you if you have a bunch of abandoned wells, put each well in its own little subseries. And then if that well blows up and kills a bunch of stuff, your your treasury is insulated from from liability. Yeah. But the people that know this stuff are sophisticated and they're getting paid a good bit to continue as things are. And I would say something else I've seen in the oil field is like we're talking about like public liabilities. And and once an area gets degraded and polluted to a certain extent, it becomes cheaper for Exxon or Oxy to buy the surface than it does for them to remediate. And so a, a highly significant part of the Permian Basin, the surface itself is owned by the oil companies. They don't give a shit what happens to the surface. They own it just so they don't have to pay themselves surface damages whenever they spill stuff. A point of leverage here, University of Texas. The University of Texas has an endowment that has just recently gotten bigger than Harvard's. And that's because UT was, it's a land grant college. And so whenever Texas like joined the union or whatever, it gave like 2.2 million acres of land in West Texas to fund University of Texas. And that land is very much Permian Basin. It is tremendously exploited. The GLO, the, the general land office, leases out these university lands for all kinds of stuff. And one of my midterm goals would be to see regenerative contracts in this environment where public or semi-public lands are being improved via the ecosystem service model. So to that point, and I'm trying to bring it down to a useful level of what we're, what we're doing here in this work session, if we can create a model that looks at all these things like in a holistic way, if you go back to the original Notion page, there's some work we did a year ago that it was a climate sprint. It was more in depth than this one, but we looked at ecosystem services and, and co-benefits and carbon. And we came up with the core benefits label, which is like a whole, holistic tool to analyze any type of climate project. But if we can apply what we're working on here to like any property, right? Let's say, Will, you have an acre down the, the street, or I have, have half an acre here in Carbondale. And there's some interesting side work of like urban ecosystems happening. But let's say if you can scale that, you can do it on one of those properties or two of those properties. And then you go to UT and you say, look, we, we're going to use the same. So that's. That's what, and Adam, this is one thing I want to talk to you about is like the systems thinking or the design around this of like, how do you make it work on a half acre? How do you make it work on 10 acres, a hundred acres on 10,000 acres in it? Like in like Basin, for example, we had a call yesterday with a fortune 500 company that owns, that has at least 500 excess properties, vacant properties. They're like, shit, and we don't, we don't know how to tell the story around it. We can't sell them and we're trying to sell them for too much money. We do have this big carbon plan, this natural capital plan, but we don't really know how to connect 
those three things. So like Basin, and that's why I want all of you to be a part of Basin at some point. And you've, a lot of you already are, but like, how do you go to a big corporation like that? Or a land trust, Charlie, if you're going around to like land trust after land trust and you say, okay, hey, if you deploy this methodology to assess the property, like, like Jeff always says, like land trusts already have a list of like a hundred properties they want to buy, like in, in a watershed or in an ecosystem, a region, they already know what but they don't know how to monetize it or do something with it per, per se, besides just put it in a conservation easement and run some cattle on it and go raise a bunch of money. So to that point, like in the work we're doing over the next three weeks or the next, next two sessions, how can it be like applied? And maybe I'm dreaming here, but like, how can it be applied to a giant portfolio? One property, two properties, half acre. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think we were talking to, I was talking with Will and it's, it's really about the prototype. It's about prototyping this and getting people who do agroforestry, because to me, where I'm sitting, it looks like the global food chain is going to hit the fan at some point in the next five to 10 years. So if you can get carbon credits by growing food, and there's a lot of cost ongoing that, that goes into that for sure. But to me, I think, I think food is where carbon credits can meet ecosystem services, where it can also meet Hey, let's remove the carbon credits and ecosystem services. And we are still growing food at, at a decent margin or at least break even because all you need to do is break even on the food because carbon credits are reality right now and, and housing. Yeah. Housing as well. The difficult thing with that is it takes a lot of resources to house people, but there are definitely ways to, if you look at the Regenesis Institute, brilliant designers, they've been doing regeneration. They pioneered that in the nineties and they've been doing billion dollar regeneration infrastructure projects with cities across the world. That is an organization where you're like, Hey, we need houses that are net zero water, net zero carbon and, and community owned growing facilities. And they'll be like, cool, we'll put together a proposal for you. So I think it's really thinking about what are the tracks of sure revenue now and, and building to that while knowing that building to that won't compromise two generations down, the land's going to be better off and doing our due diligence there. That's, that's just what comes to my mind, but I don't know if that's like a. Yeah, no, no, that's awesome, Adam. And that's something, it, it, Charlie, it, it resonates with something that, uh, God, I'm spacing his name now, Alex from, uh, from Regen CLT. Uh, yeah, that we, we originally talked about is if the land trust owns the property and then someone wants to put housing on part of it, someone wants to do ag, like Adam, to your point, someone wants to do ag on part of it, you do carbon on all the property. But that, that's to me what this methodology, that's what we're trying to do is figure out those different layers. And then you could either, you can either rent those uses, sell those uses or give those uses, right? Like you get the, and if it's community governed, how do you set up gover governance around the property around, around whatever the land trust covers, like Charlie in, in your and Alex's example, like how do you govern that? If you, if the land trust owns a piece of property, how do you govern it? How do you manage it? How do you determine who gets to use what? Yeah. So the way that we have it set up just super briefly, is just like a three part governance. So one of the voting boxes or one of the sort of voting groups is the leaseholders. It could be region network, could be basin. It could be this really awesome agroforestry farm. The second one is the community around the area. So you actually have community. So people who aren't necessarily living on the land that the community land trust owns, but that they're in that basin, they're in that community. And then the third bucket is reserved for people who are meant to speak for the rights of nature, speak on behalf of the land itself and also indigenous wisdom. So that way you actually have the land that has a seat at the table. And you have people who, you know, whose legal obligation is to speak for the land and what's best for the land. That's the way that we have it set up. Yeah, I think there's still like a lot of learning and development to be done. But uh, yeah, I think that another thing that came up when you were speaking, Timo, is just like also just finding the right partner organizations for a lot of these. Like for a lot of these, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's really just like we have this layer that we've decided that is the agroforestry layer. And who do we know in this local community who wants to run an agroforestry farm? And then they can profit from that. And then they'll have certain requirements in terms of like stewardship practices that they need to do. No spraying, no like trucking off all the topsoil, no leaving soil bare for the winter so it all washes away. But yeah, I think just like finding the right sort of stack of partner organizations could also be a really cool benefit from this working group is just having a list, having our list of the stack that we're creating, water rights, all, all the different things. I don't even need to give examples of them. And then have sort of a list of two or three of the leading partner organizations that are doing work on that layer. And even just open sourcing that could be a pretty amazing toolkit to provide 
yeah, different community land trusts and landowners, which is uh, my understanding is basically this is the base and methodology that you're kind of working on, right? Well, yeah. So I, I was, yeah, there's so many good things in there to unpack around rights of nature. Jeff always talks about, it's not just about the property or the, the locale or the polygon. It's actually what what's happening in a region, right? right. Around, if you have if you have five properties out of a hundred, all of a sudden doing these things, what does that do to the, the hundred area region or polygon region? And then, yeah, then rights of nature of managing for the long term. So just as an example, in the, like the license on the basin methodology is not commercial at this point, because what we're going to use it for is basically 10%, depending on the situation, is going to go back to the basin trust, which is very similar, Charlie, to what you're talking about. And the basin trust isn't like this. We're not trying to own everything, but it's just, like we have these weird properties we want to like own in the commons and steward in the commons. And we want to buy basically the most dilapidated, rundown piece of shit properties anywhere and re restore and regenerate them and then put the best, like the pristine, like I call it the trophy. That's, that's a bad word too. And in, in refi, but like the trophy biodiversity parts or the trophy geological parts in the trust that's managed by the, the basin token in perpetuity. Like the, if you're a basin token holder, you have rights to governance rights over all these properties. And then we're still working out, like, how do you do that around Charlie, what you mentioned with the, the local community and like local stakeholders and do they use basin token or do they, or do they use the regen groups module and they have a separate governance and value flow related to like on the ground. But in, in like, I think sometimes like with like region CLT, for example, like it's easy to think that like basin might be competing with a group like that or other, like other land trust, but like we have our own lane we want to stay in. We have these Jeff's obsessed with beer bearers. We're obsessed with like algae and like bio crust and like these weird wetlands and stuff that like for our own reasons. So it's like that, that's, yeah. But the idea being is that we license it and if Regen CLT wants to use it or someone Aspen Valley Land Trust wants to use it, 10% of whatever they make goes in the Basin Treasury. It doesn't go to Jeff, doesn't go to me, doesn't go to whoever. It goes in the Basin Trust Treasury that then gives Basin the ability to go out and do this more and buy, buy more property yeah. or obtain more rights and under that government yeah. structure. Awesome. That's super illuminating. I like that, that 10% back to Basin, the central bank Basin, whatever you want to call it. And yeah, to clarify in terms of, I think we definitely don't see you guys as competition, mainly because we don't want to necessarily go out and create or run a million land trusts. That actually sounds like a total fucking nightmare. We want to create tools <laughs> for groups like Basin and communities that are already on the ground, that already are communities that have pieces of land in mind and that sort of just need tools. And then the tools we're currently focused on are, so the RE, the Regenerative Community Land Trust model as like a governance model and as a way of dividing votes. And yeah, just basically at one tool that a community could use to decide how the communally held land is going to get used. And then also the main problem we've seen time and time again, which is also, yeah, why you guys are here. I think everyone that's seen this is that there needs to be an economic engine. There are so many awesome communities that are on the ground that have a piece of land that they're super excited to buy and steward regeneratively, but they just don't have the fucking money to do it. And there's this huge, weird cycle with the finances for regenerative projects where it's a really long time before you can start getting money back. Whether it's agroforestry or carbon credits or something, there's like this dead zone that happens. You need to get have enough money, not only to buy the land, but to get the land through 10 to 20 years of, of regenerative stewardship before you can really start seeing returns on it. And so that's just, we don't have any answers there really, besides we've, we're working on this commons credit idea. And obviously with carbon credits and biodiversity, you can create like a stack of impact credits that you're selling. But really that's the biggest challenge that we're seeing is, is how do you create short term, it's really like long and medium term funding for these projects that won't have a return in, in a pretty long time. Yeah, it really gets back down to redefining ROI and redefining and really making this like a sellable model that investors are excited to invest in. I would be super interested to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Anyone and everyone, but especially Will. Yeah, so I, I really have the leasehold approach. But in certain circumstances, you're absolutely right. Like if we're not sure that this area isn't going to be conserved for the next 25 or 50 or longer years, it's silly to, to put all these resources into improving this area. But the flip side is if we're asking the landowner to commit to not develop that land for 50 years, 
that's basically a conservation easement because the landowner is essentially agreeing not to develop for longer than the landowner's life. But, and so in certain circumstances, I, I think the land trust is a necessary partner because whenever like a 25 year or a longer term is required, it is effectively a, a conservation easement. And it is really hard to think of some incentive that would justify the landowner giving away their right to get rich if the land would have been a great solar farm or golf course or whatever else. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think it's, that's the biggest challenge for refi. I think right now is creating a new economic models that uh, and it's easy to just be like, we're going to just create a new economic model. We're going to create an economic engine. But once you start going to investors with a pitch like this, I don't know, it's, I, I think it's just, it really comes down to, yeah, redefining as a collective culture or metrics of success around investments. The, the key is to maintain the value in the improved state. And so if this forest is making a lot of money, and if I burn down the forest or tear it down and, and put in a mall, I'm going to lose all that money. There's that incentive. And I think it's basically a non-starter. I don't, I don't really see any likelihood of getting a 25-year or longer lease. And, and so I'm looking at five or 10-year terms and then kind of like, like yes, trying to, to stack the incentives on the continued or like the perpetuation of the desired condition and not so much on achieving the desired condition in the first place. Mm. Yeah, I think that's where the stack becomes really enticing, I think, because you can start it out as a housing development, but as long as you do it the right way, it's about how we do these things, right? Like desertified land takes maybe three years to get slightly less desertified or even in some cases completely flipping it around. Yeah, if it rains. Exact. And I think there, there are ways to make it seem like a conventional investment, but it's just the way you go about it. And that's why I think building like a regenerative housing model, a regenerative food model, and the operationalizing that and being able to present that to an investor. So we're not even creating a new economic model. We're just providing them a, a different investment that will take a little bit longer to do returns. But once you have returns, it's not just housing returns. It's housing returns with a premium because of the ecosystem services. It's the, it's now you have the asset of soil which is going to be in high demand moving forward because of the undeniable macroeconomic economic conditions. And you have like the ability to grow food on that. And now you have carbon credits that you've produced by pulling it all down into the soil. And it, it just, it just takes one investor because we all know it's going to work because there's too much knowledge out there for this to not work. So I think it's just like being able to speak their language. And I think that's why I have like my conversations with Will, because it's like, what's the bridge to speak to what they know already. There are so many sustainable ESG investors, BlackRock's creating ESG funds. And, and so it's just approaching that where it's like, Hey, they're promising 3%. We're promising 10%, but it just comes after three years and smart investors know the macro conditions. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think as we see more like shit hitting the fan kind of scenarios. I think it's kind of obvious investing in resilient communities, investing in projects that build topsoil, that build food sovereignty and local food sheds. It's just like such an obvious play for any type of investor, even if their values aren't necessarily aligned. It's just like economically, it makes the most sense. But it's kind of a, it's a, it's kind of a sad thing to say. That's where we are. <laughs> yeah, Got to take it, take it and run with it. I just posted an article like all the farmers are spending $600, an extra $600 a day. 60 days out of the year because they have to pay for hay to feed their sheep. And so it's, there's gotta be some scenario where going to them and saying, Hey, if you just pause grazing on this patch of land for a year, see how much you'll, you won't have to pay for hay because they'll be able to feed on that piece of land. And if you change the approach to how you rotate and the de grazing density, all this research is out there already. So it's just, it's just about bringing the pieces together to get the money to flow. And it's about finding the people with the money, right? The money people, what language do they speak? Okay. We have the research, we have the economic modeling expertise. We just have to bring it together in one, one prototype. And uh, yeah, anyways, that's my right. No, that, that's awesome. Thanks everyone for your time, your contribution, your ideas. I, I would ask if you can, if you can at least make at least one of the next meetings so there's some continuity or, or ideally the next two, if it's going to be the same time for the next two Tuesdays. And if you, if you can't make the meetings, if you have time, I just added in today's page, today's Notion page, I, I put next steps, homework, 
And just three things. One, looking at the registry page, we're making a list of all the different registries of where you can register carbon credits or, or methodologies or water or natural capital biodiversity. So there's definitely some that we've missed. We're not talking about marketplaces at all. We're just talking about like, where can you actually put the methodology to then mint whatever the asset is, the carbon or ecological asset. That's number one. Number two, we're looking at natural capital and ecosystem accounting frameworks. There's some really cool stuff coming down the, the pike in terms of the task force for nature or nature uh, related financial disclosure or the task force for climate disclosure, which is already in effect. There's some cool stuff with natural asset companies. Some of this is proprietary that we won't really be able to get access to. But the, the goal here is to like, rather than bent the wheel, if there's another one on there from the UN or in the, the ICUN called SEA or S-E-E-A, like System for Ecological and Ecosystem Economic Accounting or something like that. So we're not trying to figure out all these different units of account. Like, well, we're going to have a meeting next week around like the, the White House natural capital thing. W what I see happening is that there's going to be these standard units of account. And if we can just get ahead of that and start to use these, like, in our property stack or the basin stack or whatever, like we know biodiversity is going to be one. We know pollination is going to be one. We know carbon is going to be one. We know water and air quality, probably recreation and culture. But the idea, the reason we started at that big list is we're trying to narrow it down and then see how they fit in to these existing frameworks. So that, that's number two, if you have time. And then number three, just a, this is just a real estate concept. Real estate value is is based around what's called highest and best use. In, the, in our world, we, we call it improved property, like appraisers value a property with a building more, right, than a piece of vacant land. There's something wrong, right, with our society when you say that like cutting the forest down and destroying the ecosystem is more valuable than a housing development, or, or, or not as valuable as a house, or excuse me, more valuable than housing development, right, or like a commercial development. So this thing about like higher, in better use as opposed to highest and best. So what we're trying to focus on is higher and better rather than highest and best. And we're trying to look at like this holistic lens of Mr. Commercial Real Estate Appraiser, you are forget you're not accounting for ecosystem services. You're not accounting for pollination. You're not accounting. Jeff uses this example all the time. Like some of these properties should be way more valuable once we come along. Once Charlie applies it to the land trust model, in this piece of property is they're asking a million for it as a farmland, but then you add this to it and it's like, oh, if you start accounting for all these natural capital accounts, it's actually worth a million five. And that's, that's not even taking into account like leasing and income. And it's just like the balance sheet of the property grew significantly. So that, that's where I'll leave it to at. But if you have time, you should have access to the Notion page. If you don't, does everyone know which, which the, it's the lower Notion page. I just put under uh, past meetings and recordings and, I'm, and I'll add all our notes. You're welcome to add other notes there as well, but I'm going to, I'm going to type up notes. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Brett. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks guys. Thanks, Jeff.